Hey there, it's Ruby Jones. Each Sunday, we're sharing one of our favourite episodes from our sister podcast, Read This. The show features interviews with some of Australia's best and most beloved writers. Today, we're going to hear from Bruce Pascoe. Bruce is a novelist and historian whose 2014 book, Dark Emu, became a national bestseller. Michael Williams is the host of Read This, and he's with me now. Ruby Jones. Hello, Michael. How are you? I'm great. Lovely to be back with you again for another episode of Read This. So on this episode, listeners are going to hear your conversation with Bruce Pascoe. Tell me a bit about how you first came to read his work. Listeners are going to have to put up with me waxing a little nostalgic in this episode because I first met Bruce on a family camping holiday in Malakuta where uh, he was selling copies of his book at the farmer's market on a Sunday and I went and bought one because I'd run out of things to read on the summer holidays. <laughs> and that was the first time I read Bruce's book or met Bruce the human being. So we do have a little nostalgic reverie about Malakuta. But my favourite thing about this episode is that Bruce Pascoe was well and truly dragooned into the culture wars when Dark Emu came out. News Limited in particular decided that he was public enemy number one for the ways in which he wanted to rethink First Nations history in this country. And so it meant that a lot was written, a lot was said about Bruce that didn't represent who he is, the kind of scholar he is, the kind of thinking he does, and the deep integrity and generosity of his storytelling. And so for me, it was very exciting to have an opportunity to talk to the actual author about what motivated him rather than rely on secondhand nonsense. Mm, It's true. So much of the narrative around Bruce is around the controversy that has been stirred up by what he's written and less on the craft of his writing. Absolutely. And I think listeners will be very surprised to hear what the new novel's about and hear Bruce talk about it. It couldn't be more diametrically opposed to the kind of preconceptions that I think people bring to the table when it comes to this fabulous writer. Coming up in just a moment, all Bruce Pascoe needs is a barrow. When I was a kid, my mother would take my sisters and I for camping holidays in the height of summer. Of the recurring destinations, Malakuta was a particular favourite. On the edge of Crow Jingalong National Park, at the mouth of this series of beautiful inlets, it's on the far north coast of Victoria. And it's one of those places where, while the year-round population is only about a thousand, in summer, when the camping ground is full, that number is more like 8,000. I remember those long, glorious days splashing around on Becca Beach or sitting in the basketball hall watching the makeshift cinema. But of those entertainments, the absolute pinnacle was the farmer's market each weekend, not least because it was a reliable source of second-hand books. It was there one summer, having exhausted the reading I'd packed for the holiday, that I picked up my first Bruce Pascoe novel. In hindsight, it's clear to me that the quiet bloke with the big beard who sold it to me was the author himself. This wasn't a second-hand stall. This was someone who loved to write, making a connection with potential readers, in between the Dreamcatcher stall and the homemade chutneys. That more than two decades later, Bruce Pascoe would be a household name was unthinkable at the time. That he would still be writing, still honouring his commitment to telling a great story, that is utterly unsurprising. I'm Michael Williams and this is Read This, the show about the books we love and the stories behind them. It was 2014 when Bruce Pascoe went from being a prolific yet relatively unknown writer to public enemy number one in Australia's culture wars. That was the year he published his now infamous book, Dark Emu, and its re-examination of accepted historical accounts of pre-invasion Australia. It's a book that struck a chord. More than 360,000 copies have been sold so far, and it's inspired various spin-off books, from a young adult edition to entire books published to refute its claims about First Nations people and their relationship with the land. News Corp in particular have expended a lot of energy framing Bruce as this ahistorical force of propaganda. It's nasty, ugly stuff. But part of what I like about Bruce Pascoe is his calm, implacable generosity. 
He's engaged critics and detractors and welcomed the debate. For all the attempts to co-opt him into the culture wars, Bruce is not so interested. He has other stories to tell. And the latest one is his novel Imperial Harvest. It's set in 13th century Mongolia, and it follows a one-armed soldier, Yen Si, as he contemplates the expectations of others and how a single person can navigate war and colonialism with grace and endurance. And it begins with a disclaimer, this author's warning, that sums up how Bruce Pascoe approaches the world. This novel tells a story of great armies, the calumny of powerful men travelling across the vast lands of Eurasia. But if there's a date here or a town there which seems strange, remember that history tosses all fact in the air so the victor can choose his own confetti. In this case, the confetti is chosen by the losers. So be patient. It's not always possible to catch the pieces in their original order. And in any case... It will be confetti again tomorrow. Don't be dismayed by this fact. You're alive, aren't you? I love the idea of it returning to confetti and also telling your readers not to be dismayed. I mean, often, particularly with historical fiction, we have this anxiety of not just what's true and what's not, but what's a legitimate speaking position from which to tell history and what's Mm. not. And setting that note at the front of the novel seems to be saying, it's a book. It's here for you to have fun, see what it sparks. Mm. There is a lot of implied goodwill in that request of your readers. And because of that, it ends in a restaurant where people uh, enjoy wine, they enjoy food, and they enjoy sharing it. And they are slightly alarmed by their company. It was meant to be a kind gesture of asking people not to hate, but to come together a little bit. And, you know, it's, it's easy for people to polarise their situation and to take positions. But I'll never forget being told by a very old Hawaiian woman that when you're having these arguments, leave no one behind. In my own town of Malakuta, there are debates which have ended up being polarised when a perfectly good compromise situation was available. You know, compromise is messy, muddy, unsatisfying to most people, but they're usually more right than wrong. And we need to treasure the messiness of democracy because the the cleanliness of autocracy um, is to be abhorred. And we've seen no good example in the world of autocracies, where marginal groups weren't flayed. So I hope we can sit down in a a restaurant together, the restaurant being the world, and keep talking. When people think Bruce Pascoe, they don't generally think 13th century Mongolia. So (laughs) what's that about? Yeah, I know everyone was expecting um, a, a certain kind of novel, and it did come as a a bit bit of a surprise to a lot of people, but the whole idea of the novel is to look at the propensity of men to commit violence. Where does it come from? And I didn't want to just concentrate on the Europeans because people are expecting me to be critical of um, European colonialism, but there are other examples of colonialism and Genghis Khan is as good as any. Oh, it's one of the biggies. I mean, yeah. that's, a, a, that's a decent one to go for, to lean oh, into. Well, to cover an entire continent is um, pretty ambitious. Before we get to Khan, though, temperamentally, is that typical of you, Bruce? Like, you know what people expect from you, and so you're determined not to give it to them? Oh, it wasn't a determination. This, this novel I've been writing for 15 years, so it began before Dark Emu. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not a curmudgeon in that sense. I am a curmudgeon in many senses, but not that particular one. It's just the way my thoughts have been going, and they're a little bit out of sync. But to me, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm just looking forward to talking about the book, and for readers to wonder about the book, and then 
let's have a conversation about it because it's the conversation is very timely. The conversation is incredibly timely, and sadly, it always will be. Like a conversation about the nature of war, about the ways in which it impacts a life, a yeah. psyche, a, a people more generally. You're always going to be blessed with that feeling topical. Yeah. Look, when I went to school, I was taught that war is the natural condition of man. And uh, I thought at the time, what a bleak prospect for the world. What a bleak prospect for people, individuals, that we have to do that. I remember in primary school listening to the last post on Anzac Day and being so deeply affected by it because, you know, our family had lost people in both wars. And they were very emotional services. And I thought, gee, we're just going to keep doing this forever. There'll be a new Anzac Day and it'll just repeat ad infinitum. And I thought how sad that was. But I, I didn't have the resources as a kid to look at whether or not that is the truth. And I've been very fortunate to have met and lived with people who have another experience of the world, the the Aboriginal cultural world, and our families are connected to that story. And it's a story without war. So what I'm really hopeful for is that Australia can have this conversation that is war the natural condition of man? Is there another way for humans to behave towards each other? And I think there is. I think that's a fabulous philosophical challenge for this country to think that it might have on this continent a solution to what's happening in Palestine at the moment. I I love that idea and it's a kind of stirring and wonderful thought, but I can't help but feel that colonial Australia, settler Australia, does what so many countries do in its national myth building, which is it appears to believe that war is essential for your sense of yourself. We fetishise that experience of war rather than look for a way to never reproduce it. Yeah, we, we see it as essential to ourselves. And that, you know, if an argument gets to a certain point, then eventually you will go to arms. And that's a legitimate political and philosophical stance to take. So to consider something else is going to take maybe 230 years. And I obviously won't be around, but I'm I'm determined to contribute to that debate. And for Australia to consider that their idea of Australian history might need some refinement or that what Aboriginal Australian people were doing was not hunting and gathering. We can see by the turmoil that has erupted uh, subsequent to that discussion taking place that it's it's really hard to change people's minds and that they won't change them peacefully. Well, I do think there is something in what you had to endure in response to Dark Emu that is a real precursor to the way the voice referendum took place, which is that there was a request, an offering of a space for a conversation. And in instead of responding to that in good faith and taking it as a conversation, recognising that there might be ground to be met in the middle, there might be disagreement, there might be whatever, but the conversation itself is valuable, instead of responding in that way, the response was vitriolic and violent and about tearing down rather than about being willing to take the chat further. Yeah, I I think there is a great parallel there, but I believe strongly that, say, in 150 years when kids at university are sitting down to do their essays, that they will be looking at the events of last year and the no vote will be a footnote. But I think Australia has an enormous and positive opportunity to 
lead the world intellectually on this point, not always, you know, it's not a league ladder and you don't remain champion forever, but in this particular little moment of time, I, I think Australia can make a really decent contribution to world conversation about how we behave as humans. And what I, I love about the old people and all, all the so-called myths or stories, it's really philosophy that we're talking about. And that philosophy is one of enormous peace about the kind of structures you put in place to control humans because the human is a really difficult animal. The human will always be jealous, always be violent, always be loving, always be honourable, all of that mix that is in all of us. The human's always going to be like that. But to consider how best to use each of those, uh, suppress some and enhance others, I think it's an enormous thing. I just think it's a great thing for uh, humans to consider and for us to discuss. Um, it's not a blueprint that will be built tomorrow. It's, it's up for discussion. It's one of the things I so enjoy about your intellectual and cultural contribution generally, Bruce, is the optimism I don't understand. I'm sorry. I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you hold it, and I wish I shared it, and that is great. But it, it, the generosity of inviting the conversation, inviting the chat, responding to your critics by saying, absolutely, let's talk about it. That's not it. Like, there are very few people in public life I can think of who have more grace when it comes to believing in the value of what you're doing beyond whether people agree with you or don't agree with you. You can blame my mother and grandmother for that yeah. um, because they insisted on decency. And uh, I haven't been able to escape that tug in my brain. But also, I think I'm in a good position to be in the argument because, you know, obviously over 80% of our family is white um, and a small percentage is Aboriginal. So... I've got an obligation to both sides and I've got a huge obligation to white Australia because that's where most of our genes come from. I have an obligation to that side of the family to say, look, I'm not ignoring the Cornishman, I'm not ignoring the Englishman, um, but there's this other thing and it's Australian. This is where we can have an effect on the history of the country. When we return, Bruce reveals why seaside towns are places of dissent. We'll be right back. I remember reading one of your novels many, many years ago mm. and being being so moved by the way you wrote, being so kind of carried along by the story. But also you write books clearly from a place of having an idea about the world that you want to share, you want to prosecute, you want to imagine. Mm. Yeah, and um, I was talking to Melissa Lukashenko and Deborah Dank yesterday morning about Charles Dickens. This is a good conversation, good literary conversation, because we'd all read Dickens and we'd all felt touched by his compassion. But I've just read um, Priya Satya, Time's Monster, where she talks about Dickens's uh, fascism yep. as well. And that was <laughs> incredibly disappointing. But he's a, he's a human. Yep. He's, he's a flawed human. We're, we're all flawed humans. And um, it was just a fascinating conversation and it's very relevant. When we're having these conversations, it's never black and white. The, the shades of grey, another literary reference, are immense. And we have to accommodate that. We have to continue to have the conversation rather than saying you're too white or you're too black, you're so grey. And just keep talking and democracy is the slowest beast on earth mm. but it's a very very good beast to have a, in our paddock 
So accepting that you knew you wanted to write about the nature and the legacy of war and colonialism, you knew you wanted to begin that story, that journey in the Northern Hemisphere, and you knew that actually European colonialism wasn't the path that you wanted to look at. That kind of explains 13th century Mongolia as a choice. But tell us a little bit about a particular one-armed horseman called Yen Si and why he was the vessel for the story that you wanted to tell. Well, I, I really wanted to choose someone who history would ignore. He wasn't a general. He wasn't even a particularly brave soldier. He was nothing. He was on the scrap heap of humanity. But he had the, the good fortune to fall into the company of a really good man who was also never going to be noticed by history, a baker, a miller. But that miller, his life's journey had taught him, because of the pain he had endured, that people need care. So in a way, it's Penkai who is the driver of the story. Yen Sei is just swept up in the stream and becomes more worldly and becomes more aware of his position as a human and finds himself in a position to make change. So I, I wanted a, an anonymous person. When I began writing Imperial Harvest, I was very anonymous. You know, you mentioned having read my novels. Well, I wondered who bought that book because, um, you know, I, I've written seven or eight novels and the sales of each was really small. I reckon I bought it from you in person in Mallacoota beside the camping ground there in the, yeah. when the market set up yeah. and I bought it from you then on a camping holiday. Yeah. Well, I, we, we sold books um, from that little tent for a decade or more, nearly two decades, and um, the conversations in that tent, um, if they ever got to the um, Australia Spy Agency, we'd be all in trouble because it was a ferment um, <laughs> of uh, uh, rebellion. I, I think the spy agencies know not to look at Malakuta, that it's a, it's a hotbed, there's dangerous stuff going on there. Yeah. They're better to turn a blind eye. Well, I, one of my novels talks about seaside villages as being places of dissent because fishermen uh, don't give a stuff about anyone. Yeah, no, and they've got time to talk things through. It's uh, not about action. It's about mm. about scheming. Yeah, it is, and in, in uh, Imperial Harvest, there are whole, um, a whole groups of uh, sailors and fishermen, and that's what they do. They... they because their their life is on the sea, they feel themselves totally independent of the land, and they have contempt for politicians, um, and they're pirates. You know, the sea and piracy go together. It's one of the very nice things about how the book functions, Imperial Harvest functions, and you kind of alluded to this before, but is because it centres around a protagonist who is passive's the wrong word, but is kind of buffeted by war by circumstance, by history. It means that the characters who emerge around the fringes of the story mm. uh, are often incredibly compelling. They're pushing it forward in really interesting ways. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm glad um, you see it like that because I, I was afraid that my mangling of history um, <laughs> would have become a theme because if you, it's not an historical novel because it, I've, I've shifted geographies, I've shifted historical events, um, but I'm, I'm more fascinated by people than I am by history. And it, uh, people uh, generate history, but it's more or less like an aside. It's the people themselves. And I think goodness and badness um, drive the world and it's, um, it's up to us to decide which is which. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Finally, just because I have to ask for myself, because I haven't been back for years, how's Malakuta going post the fires? Malakuta is its wonderful self. Um, you know, three rivers, two lakes, the ocean. 
it's um, hard to destroy the beauty of that. Uh, the bush recovered very quickly, the people not as quickly. Um, friends of mine w put the roof on their, their house um, a fortnight ago after losing their house in the fire. Another good friend of mine was a renter, doesn't have a house at all. Yeah. The psyche of the town is different. And, and maybe it's my age group because I've lost a lot of friends I've known since 1970 in the last few years. And they were the real rebels and ratbags and the people with whom... If you caught their eye in the street, they would not let you go because they'd want to talk to you about politics. They'd want to um, tell you how dis uh, disgraceful the Australian cricket team is. Uh, all that conversation, a lot of that's gone, so the, the fun for me has gone out of the town. But there, there are young kids there making their own legends yeah. and their own society, to which I'm not a party. And I have to get used to that because I'm an old man. We all have to get used to that one way or the other, but as long as you keep writing books, you've got that entry point straight back into that. You can be an old man on the edge, keeping an eye. <laughs> look, I, writing's such a wonderful thing, you know. I, I look at musicians, you know, tugging their cello onto the aeroplane, and um, artists, you know, with rolls and rolls of fine paper, and, um, and you know, I jump on the plane with a biro. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Bruce Pascoe, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Bruce Pascoe's latest novel, Imperial Harvest, is out now. You can get it at all good independent bookstores. And just to piss off Andrew Bolt, go buy another copy of Dark Emu while you're at it. Just to twist the knife. Thanks for listening to Bruce Pascoe on Read This. For the next couple of months, we're going to bring you some of the best interviews from the show every Sunday. Listen out for conversations with Eric Beecher, Mary Beard and more. And if you don't want to wait until next Sunday to dive in to read this, you can search for it wherever you listen to podcasts. There's a whole year's worth of fascinating conversations ready for you. <laughs>